I think Alex is with us. Uh, Alex, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Alex. Hey, Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, it's uh, at last. It's nice to uh, talk about DynamoDB, and there's no better person to talk about DynamoDB than you. You know, and uh, if you can uh, tell us uh, a little bit about what um, you've been uh, focusing on lately, and uh, how did you progress with DynamoDB? Sure thing, will do. Um, yeah, so my name is Alex Debris. I'm an AWS data hero just um, from some of the work I've done with DynamoDB. So um, two and a half years ago, I made a site called dynamodbguide.com. So you can go check that out if you want to. And it's just like a, a free, easier introduction to how to work with DynamoDB. Um, so that's kind of how I got started. Um, and then over the years have done more talks and things like that. I spoke at reInvent last year and a few different AWS summits on that. And, and then in April, I released the DynamoDB book, which is just a, a comprehensive guide to data modeling with, with DynamoDB. So it really takes you through uh, sort of, you know, if you're, a, if you're a beginner just getting used to DynamoDB, you can, you can check that out and get started there. Even if you've used it a little bit, I think it'll help, um, help you understand how to model your data with DynamoDB, especially because it's so different than a, a relational database. So yeah, I released that in April and it's been going pretty well. And then just been doing talks and training and consulting and things like that um, since then. Yeah, you're, uh, you're joining us from uh, Omaha, right? Nebraska. Yep, Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. And uh, how's the weather today? In Omaha? It's it's good. It's actually a little cooler than usual. Uh, it's like I think the high is gonna be 79 Fahrenheit today, uh, which the last couple of days or last couple of weeks it's been in the 90s usually. So it's been pretty hot. So we get a few nice days here, but um, it's hot and humid a lot. Got someone from Chicago, Hassan. We were just talking right now. That's He's... great. Yeah, we're not too far away. That's only eight hour drive or so. So yeah, I've been. I actually was in Sydney, Nebraska. I had to. Go oh really? To... That's yeah, that's where I, uh, I grew up out there. Yeah, I uh, grew up in Scotts Bluff, which is okay, yeah, just yeah. 100 miles from there. Were, were you were living in Sydney? Sorry? You, you were living in Sydney for a while? No, 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 no way. I, I went there and it was the middle of nowhere. No way. <laughs> yeah, it truly yeah, it went really is now because now, yeah, now Cabela's is, has sold and now that time, town is really dying. But um, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, there's not much going on there. Yep. So guys, this uh, session is going to be recorded. Uh, so we're going to publish it later on on um, our YouTube channel as well, if uh, you don't mind. And uh, Alex also prepared uh, a, uh, a presentation. Um, so we're going to share it now. Alex, you think? Uh... Yeah, sure. I think I can get this started. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this. Um, I'm gonna try and share the audio too. So maybe someone in the chat, make sure that it's it's working. And then if you have any questions during, feel free to type in the chat. If it's a quick question, I can just answer it directly in the chat. If it's a more involved question, I can hang around after and, and answer questions for a while um, there too. So yes, so when, with that. Okay. So when we finish, like when we learn about Dynamo right now, and uh, I think uh, secondary indexes as well, you focus, you're gonna focus on that. Um, so we can discuss uh, with Alex any questions we have, any um, uh, maybe ideas we have for different use cases. Uh, so, yeah. Cool, sounds good. So, let me now with that, I'm gonna stop my video and my mic. Hey folks, and thanks for having me. Um, I'll introduce myself in a second, but first I wanna talk about what, what we're gonna be talking about today. And we're gonna be talking about Amazon DynamoDB. Now, this is a database from Amazon, and it's a really exciting technology. I think is, is really blowing up in popularity right now. And I wanna talk about why it's blowing up, why it's so popular. And I think one of the most interesting things about DynamoDB is it's gonna give you consistent performance at any scale. And this is really unique in databases. So I wanna talk about you know how other databases traditionally work. So here's a little chart I'm gonna make, kind of uh, ad hoc and, and, and a little interesting, but on the x-axis here, we have data size, right? And this isn't, this isn't perfect, but you can see it goes from, you know, one gig to 10 gig to hundred gig up to a terabyte. And then on the left side, you know, we have performance and, and again, not exact measurements here, but what you've, if you could think of it from going from blazing fast to, you know, just regular fast to sluggish to painful. 
Now, if you're using something like MySQL, this is what the sort of performance curve you're going to get, where at the beginning, you know, when you're at one gig, 10 gigs, you're messing around in your, your test environment, or maybe you've just gone to production, you're going to love the performance it gives you. It's going to be really good. Uh, but then as you start to get up and, and really start to explode, you know, if you get a couple hundred gigabytes, now you have to investigate, right? Because it's gone from blazing fast down to fast or even sluggish. And you're saying, hey, why isn't this feeling as good as it used to? And, you know, at some point, it's going to move into that painful area. And now you need to re-architect and rethink about how you're actually doing your data access. So a lot of these databases have this sort of performance curve where it's hard to tell where they're not going to scale and, and as you get into these bigger data sizes. Now, if you look at DynamoDB, that performance cu curve is different. It's going to be basically flat, right? And you're never going to get that, that blazing fast performance of maybe uh, one or two milliseconds, but it's going to be consistently fast at just a couple milliseconds, you know, five to 15 milliseconds. So it's going to be fast, but that's going to be true at one gig, at 10 gig, at 100 gig, at a terabyte. It's going to be true in your test environment and in production five years later. And the great thing about this is you don't have that overhang, that drag of, am I going to have to re-architect or we're going to have to investigate and see how to make this faster. You're going to get the same performance from DynamoDB over time. And so I think that's a really interesting part of DynamoDB. And that's one thing that, that I took for granted um, before. And now I really love about it. Um, a second thing that people really love about DynamoDB is it has this very flexible billing model where instead of paying for CPU and RAM, you're actually paying for what you use directly. You're paying for read capacity units. You're paying for write capacity units. So if you know your access patterns uh, pretty decently and, and know your traffic, you can actually calculate exactly how much you need uh, and provision those exactly rather than trying to guess at how that's going to convert into CPU and RAM. Uh, and, then, and then the great thing about this is, you know, if you don't know your access patterns, you don't know your traffic, you can actually do on-demand billing, paper request billing, where they're just going to charge you directly for the requests you make and you don't have to provision and plan in advance. So that's uh, really awesome, really flexible. And then finally, DynamoDB is very serverless friendly, and that's where it's really taken off in the last couple of years. And, you know, based on a couple of different things, including the connection model, uh, but also the permissions model, the provisioning model, that billing model that we already talked about, for a lot of reasons, it works really well with serverless architectures. And I think that's why it's really been blowing up in the last couple of years. So with that in mind, I want to introduce this talk. And this talk is about getting the most out of secondary indexes in DynamoDB. And secondary indexes are a very important part of how you model your data in DynamoDB. So we're going to talk about some pro tips for that today. Um, in terms of an overview of how we're going to cover this, I want it to be accessible to people that are new to DynamoDB. So we are going to cover some basics up front. So we're going to start off with some DynamoDB basics. That's going to be terminology, some key concepts you need to know. And then I want to talk about SQL versus NoSQL. And DynamoDB is this NoSQL database. And how you model in DynamoDB and in NoSQL is very different from, from SQL, from a relational database. So I want to talk about some of that and, and why we do some of the things we do in, in NoSQL before we get move on to some advanced stuff. And then we'll move, move into the meat of this talk. Where we're going to cover secondary index basics. You know, what is a secondary index? Why would you use it? As well as some best practices for using secondary indexes. In terms of who I am, I'm Alex Debris. I recently wrote the DynamoDB book, which is a, a, a book to data modeling, a guide to data modeling with DynamoDB. A couple of years ago, I also created DynamoDBGuide.com. That's a free resource out there. That's just a gentle introduction to DynamoDB if you're new to it. Um, I'm an AWS data hero and just a general AWS and, and serverless fan. Uh, if you want to know more about the DynamoDB book, I, I recommend you go check that out. I really think it's the most comprehensive guide to data modeling with DynamoDB out there. You know, it's 450 pages plus a bunch of extras, and it covers things like relationships, you know, one-to-many relationships, many-to-many relationships, sorting, filtering, all this stuff, and has these five walkthrough examples. So we walk through some serious situations, including, you know, we model the entire GitHub metadata backend. So if you're thinking about uh, GitHub, you know, you have users, you have organizations, you have repos, you have issues, pull requests, stars, forks, all that uh, we cover out how to how to model that in DynamoDB. So a very complex application. So you can go check that out at DynamoDBbook.com. And with that, let's get started with the talk and let's talk about some DynamoDB basics first. So I want to start off with some terminology. And there are four key terms that you really need to know that we're going to start off with first. And those terms are table, item, primary key, and attribute. I'm going to cover this by way of an example to just bring it home a little bit. So imagine you have, you know, users in your application. I'm going to show how each of these terms applies to maybe a user's table in your application. So first of all, we're starting off here and we have four different records. These are different users in our application. You know, we have myself, Alex Ree, as well as a, a few folks that work at Amazon or AWS. We have Jeff Bezos, Jeff Barr, Warner Vogels, 
uh, the like. You know, so all of these records together, that's going to be called a table, and it's going to be similar in some ways to a a table in a relational or a SQL database. You know, where you're um, keeping all of your records together. You can also think of it similar to a collection in MongoDB. Um, now, if you're looking at an individual record, that's going to be called an item. So an item is similar to a row in a relational database or a document in DynamoDB. That's going to refer to one record in your table. Now, when you create that table, you have to specify what's called a primary key on your table. And every item that you write to that table needs to include that primary key. So in this case, that primary key is username. You can see that up front there. Now, the important thing here is that each item must be uniquely identified by that primary key. So you can't have two items with the same primary key. They would just overwrite each other if you did do that. And, and primary keys are going to be very important in how you model your data. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So in addition to your primary key, you can also have additional attributes on your table. So here we have first name, last name, email for each of those users. Um, you can can, these are sort of similar to columns in a relational database uh, with with one caveat is that you don't have to specify these attributes up front. So in a relational database, you know, you would add these columns and and you would specify default values or uh, attribute types, things like that. You're not going to do that in DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is schemaless. And, and what that means is there's not going to be a schema enforced by the database itself like there would be with a relational database. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a schema somewhere because if you don't have a schema somewhere, you're going to have a, a lot of problems. So what this means is you're going to have to enforce your schema in your application itself rather than at the database layer. So that's how that works. Um, one thing, you know, we talked a little bit about primary keys already, and I want to talk a little bit more about them because they are very important when you're modeling data with DynamoDB. So there are two types of primary keys in DynamoDB. The first one is called a simple primary key, and it has just a, a single element that's a partition key. And the second one is what's called a composite primary key, and that's made up of a partition key and a sort key. So the example we already saw so far, you know, with our users table, that was a simple primary key. It was made up of one element. It was that username that uniquely identified each item. Now you can imagine. Let's let's switch that over to a composite primary key and say you know we have um, we have these same users, but they all work for a different organization somewhere. They have a different employer. So that's what we have here. Now our primary key has two parts, and it has a partition key, which is the employer, and then it has the sort key, which is the username. So you can see on that first one, my employer is Debris LLC. It's it's just my company that I own and 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 I work for it. So that's my username of Alex Debris. Those other three folks, they all work for Amazon, so they have the same partition key and. You you can see them together there. Uh, one thing that's interesting there is is when you have all uh, multiple items that have the same partition key, the way the DynamoDB API works is those items are going to be co-located together. They're going to be sorted within that partition key, and it's going to be easy to access multiple items that have the same partition key. So some of the modeling concepts we're going to see uh, rely on on related items having the same partition key. So now that we know a little bit of the basics, I want to throw you for a loop a little bit and show you, you know, how SQL compares to NoSQL as part of that DynamoDB data modeling. And before we do that, I want to talk about what I call DynamoDB's guiding principle. And this isn't sort of articulated anywhere, but I think the way they design the table and design some of the features you have and, and, and more specifically features you can't do uh, are, are illustrated by this guiding principle. And the big thing is they do not want you to allow, they do not want to allow operations that won't scale. So again, they want operations that are going to work the same at one gig as they are at one terabyte. And that's how we have this chart that we were talking about before, where you're not going to see performance slow down as your data grows. You're going to get the exact same performance um, at any scale. And a lot of the concepts with DynamoDB are, are with this in mind. So the first thing I think that's important to know about um, DynamoDB is the importance of primary keys. So let's go back to our table. We talked about um, you know, the primary key a little bit before. Here's a composite primary key where we have that two-part primary key where the partition key is the employer, the sort key is that username. The important thing is when you're accessing your data in DynamoDB, you're going to be querying by that primary key. So primary key is very important, not just in uniquely identifying your data, as we talked about, but actually in how you'll access your data. Your main access patterns will happen off of your primary key. So you can query off things like employer and username, uh, but you can't query off those free form attributes like first name, last name, email. So it'd be very easy for me to say, hey, give me all the employees that work for Amazon Inc. You know, that's on the left side there on that primary key, but it'd be very 
difficult to say, hey, give me the employee record. That's, you know, Jeff at Amazon.com. That's not going to be as easy. So primary key is very important. We'll talk a little bit more about that throughout this talk. Um, the second thing that's pretty interesting about DynamoDB is there is no join operation. So, you know, if you're coming from a relational database, you're thinking about normalizing your data, and then you join that together at query time to combine two different tables and, and sort of enrich them. And, and that kind of throws people for a loop. You know, why don't you, we have this join operation? I want to talk a little bit about sort of the underlying mechanics of around DynamoDB and why uh, they don't have joins there specifically. So. You know, so far we've talked about this DynamoDB table and we sort of think about it as this one uh, big thing. But actually, you know, that's that's just a facade. That's an interface behind the scenes. Your DynamoDB data, your, your table is going to be chunked into all these different partitions. And these partitions are going to be, you know, maybe 10 gig in size max. This is invisible to you. You don't need to know about partitions, but I think it is Ill, Ill, um, it's helpful to understand uh, how DynamoDB works. So this data is chunked into all these different partitions and now you know if a, if a write request comes in someone wants to do a put item to insert a new item into that table you know let's say they want to insert andy jassy he also works for amazon inc right what they're going to do at that that front end facade this is called the request router they're going to hash that that partition key of employer. And then based on what that hash value comes out to, they're gonna determine which partition that goes to. So in this case, that goes to partition one, and it can quickly go to that partition. And the great thing about that is, number one, that's gonna be an O1 operation. No matter how many partitions you have, doing that that sort of initial hashing and then look up to which partition it belongs is gonna be constant time. So even if you add a third partition, or if you had a hundred or a thousand partitions, you know, you're getting into terabytes of data, it's very very quick to go from, you know, I have terabytes of data down to the very specific partition I need that is only, you know, five or 10 gigs that I'm messing with and, and very quick and efficient operation. So this partitioning, it helps you to, to segment that data within DynamoDB. Uh, it helps you to horizontally scale your database, but it makes it difficult to do joins because, you know, if you want to do joins, your do data needs to be located together. So you're not doing cross uh, cross node uh, requests there to join that data. So instead, what they do is just cancel joins altogether and say, you know, you need to to sort of model your data to avoid the lack of joins. So I think those are um, two important things to know about DynamoDB. And then there are three big implications that come out of that. Uh, the first implication is that you really need to know your access patterns in advance with DynamoDB. And, you know, we're not going to cover it a ton in this in, in this talk, but if you look at other talks I, I've done or that Rick Houlihan has done, or if you check out the book, uh, you know, what you're doing really with DynamoDB is you're designing your table for your access patterns. And that really means, you know, think about your access your application, go through uh, the different access patterns you're going you're to have and write them down and then design your table specifically to handle those. And then you're going to have this efficient table that can handle these specific access patterns rather than this generic one that's, that's good for sort of ad hoc querying, but is less efficient uh, for those known access patterns. Uh, the next two implications are a little uh, weirder and we're going to show some examples of it um, um, here. But uh, one of the, the next implications is that you're going to put all items into a single table. And so if you're coming from a relational world, you know, and you have uh, an e-commerce store that has customers and that has orders, you're usually putting those into, into two separate tables, right? There's a customer's table, there's an orders table, and you'll join those together at read time. But, you know, as we've talked about, there is no join operation in DynamoDB. So what we're going to do is we're going to put all those items into a single table and pre-join it in different ways that allow us to handle these more complex access patterns. Additionally, uh, because you have multiple items in a single table, multiple types of items in a single table, you're going to use very generic attributes for your primary key. You know, the examples we've shown before had username or employer for, for those primary key elements. But, you know, if you have multiple different entity types in there, if you have customers and orders and order items and inventory and all that stuff, it's unlikely that they'll have the, the same attributes that you can use for the primary key to where customer ID or order ID would make sense as the primary key. So you're going to use very generic attributes and sort of um, load those and prepare those in a way that makes sense for your access patterns. So let's bring this home and make this a little more concrete, and especially those last two points here by way of an example. So uh, I want to show an example here. Imagine you have a SaaS application. We're going to model out two different types of entities in this SaaS application in our single table. Uh, first of all, there's going to be organizations. So imagine, you know, you're creating a SaaS application. Some organization like a company will come and, and purchase your SaaS, uh, purchase your SaaS organization your SaaS uh, on behalf of their organization, get a subscription. And then there will be multiple users within that organization that will use it on behalf of that organization. So 
Let's get started with modeling. First of all, we're gonna put a couple organization items into our table, and this is what we have here. This looks a little funky, so I wanna walk through it. So first of all, if you look at the primary key, we're using a composite primary key, and we're using very generic names for those primary key elements. So the partition key, we're just calling PK. We're not calling it organization name or anything like that. We're just calling it PK. It's a very generic one. And then the sort key is going to be SK for, for sort key. So an abbreviated name there as well. Now, I also want you to look at the values we have for these um, primary key elements. If you look at both of them, they start with org hash and then they have the organization name there and what that those prefixes are doing is they're sort of identifying the the type of entity we have there and then also including the the entity name there and you know this isn't strictly required this prefixing but i like to do it just to help identify what type of item i'm using it also helps um preventing clashes if you have uh, if you have the same value for for different entity types you could overwrite them so this these these prefixes help that way it also helps with some grouping and, and some more advanced access patterns so you're going to have these the the primary key values are basically going to be generated sort of um, artificial values that, that only make sense to help organize and sort your data so those are some organization items. Let's now in that same table, let's add in some user items here. So we've done that. I've outlined these, outlined these users in red. Um, they, one thing to note there is they have the same partition key as their parent organization. So, you know, these users belong to a specific organization. They're going to have the same partition key and that's going to be uh, allowed for, for some efficient access later on. Again, that sort key is going to be different structure from that, that organization parent item. And the structure here is going to be uh, user as a prefix. So user hash and then the username uh, to make that work and to identify those, those items. Now, all of those, when you look at all the items that have the same partition key, that's called an item collection. So all items with the same partition key are an item collection. You can use a, a single item collection to retrieve multiple items uh, with that same partition key. And, and what that's gonna allow us for here is, is allow us for basically a join-like operation, right? If we can put all the, these different types of items into the same item collection with the same partition key, and if we had an access pattern that said, hey, give me the um, users for an organization, well, you might need some information about that, that parent organization to enrich those users with. So usually, you know, in a relational database, you would join those together. Here, we're gonna do it a bit differently where we just join, uh, sort of pre-join our data. We put the organization item and the user items into the same item collection, which allows us to get that pre-join relationship in a very fast and efficient way without, without worrying about joins. All right, so now we have a little bit of the basics of DynamoDB. Your head might be spinning if, you, if you're brand new to this, but try and stay with us and you know we can, I, I can answer questions later on as well. Uh, but let's talk about secondary indexes because these are a really powerful way to, to really uh, increase your DynamoDB usage here. So let's go back to that table we had with a composite primary key where we showed our, our users there and you know they belong to a particular employer. And one thing I mentioned is that you know you can query with the primary key elements and that's very efficient, but you can't query with those other attributes in your table, you know, that, um, you know, the first name, last name, email in this particular case. Um, but the problem is, you know, maybe that, that primary key handles some of your access patterns. You know, if I want to get all the employees for a particular um, employer, I could do that very easily here. But what if I have a different access pattern that says get a user by email, right? I want to say, hey, uh, can you tell me more about this um, particular employee that has the email of jeff at amazon.com? How do I go look up that particular employee? And that's where secondary indexes come in. They're going to allow you to handle more access patterns. So uh, what a secondary index is, is you're going to declare this on your table. You're going to create it on the table as a whole. And, and you're going to specify certain attributes that are, that are going to make up your secondary index. And basically items with those specified attributes are then copied into a secondary index. And it's basically a duplicate of your, of your table. The exact same data from your base table is copied over into this secondary index, but with this new primary key. So it basically gives you an additional primary key on your table. You can use, uh, you know, either a simple primary key or a composite primary key for your secondary index, just like your base table. And it allows these additional access patterns um, on your data that way. So if we go back and look at our table, you know, say we created a secondary index where uh, the partition key is email, we could do that here. And now this is what our, our data is going to look like. And you can see all of our items are still there. Now they're keyed uh, by email, which allows us to easily look up a particular user by email. And it still has all that other data. It has employer, it has username, first name, and last name there. So the important thing here is now we're keyed 
read uh, by that, that partition key of email. So um, one interesting thing um, about this, and we're going to talk a little bit more later on, is that items that don't have those attributes are not copied over. So, you know, we talked about having multiple different types of items in here. You know, imagine if in addition to your user items, you had, you know, that organization item or something like that, and the organization might not have that email attribute. Uh, that organization, if it didn't have that email attribute that, that it forms your, your primary key of your secondary index, it's not going to get copied over. And that's called a sparse index. And we're going to show that a little bit about how useful that can be uh, as we move into the best practices. So uh, last thing I want to talk about with secondary indexes is there are two different types of secondary indexes. Uh, the first type is called a global secondary index, and this is the recommended type. I almost always recommend using this one because it's much more flexible in a lot of ways. Uh, the, only thing, the only downside I would say is that you only get what are called eventually consistent reads on this data. So uh, when you write to your base table, if you made a read on that particular item directly after that, right after that, uh, on your secondary index, you know, uh, it's, it's it's possible some of those updates might not have propagated out to your secondary index. You know, it, it usually propagates it out within, you know, a couple hundred milliseconds. But if you if you really have some reads right after that, it, it, it might not have that. So you get an eventually consistent read and could have some slightly stale data. Um, on the other hand, there's a local secondary index, which allows for strongly consistent reads where it, then you can say, hey, give me a read from this index and make sure it has every update that's that's applied to this item. So I have the, the most consistent um, look at it. Uh, there are a lot of downsides of using secondary local secondary indexes. And, and one of the big, big ones is you, you must use the same partition key as the base table. So even that example we've showed uh, shown before about the, you know, where we had employer as the partition key and username as the sort key, we wouldn't be able to use that email address as the, the partition key itself. You know, we could do employer and email address, which would allow you to look for a, an email within an employer, uh, but it wouldn't allow you to, to really change up your table that much. So there are a lot of downsides to the local secondary indexes, but if you really require strongly consistent reads from your index, then you can check it out. All right, so now we know some of the basics for secondary indexes, and I want to get into some of the best practices for secondary indexes. And this is going to be a little bit advanced, especially if you know if DynamoDB is new to you, this is the first time you're hearing about it today. Some of this stuff might seem advanced, but I at least want to point you in the right direction to where you can start asking these questions and, and understanding what you should be thinking about with DynamoDB with secondary indexes. So with that in mind, let's get started on it. And the first example here is secondary indexes are a great way to handle sorting on changing attributes. And, and to really understand this, we're going to have to back up a little bit and, and learn a little bit more about how DynamoDB works. So let's look at this table example. What I have here is I have a ticketing system. So you can imagine something like Zendesk, right, where uh, maybe different companies are making different tickets. Um, so I have a primary key structure here where the partition key is the organization name. And I have two organizations that I'm showing here. I have Amazon. I also have Truck 10, who's a company I do some work with. And then uh, the sort key is going to be updated at. So it's going to be shown showing when that that ticket was most recently updated. So and just in terms of terminology, again, remember we talked about an item collection be all, all the items with the same partition key are going to be called uh, an item collection. They're going to be stored together on the same partition. Another thing about that is they're going to be sorted according to that sort key. So within a particular item collection, your items are going to be sorted according to that sort key, and they're going to be sorted in ascending order here. So you can see if you look at those timestamps, they're sorted in ascending order. Now, one thing to, to keep in mind here is, you know, that updated at value, that's going to be changing, right? If you if you take a ticket and maybe you add some comments to it or tag it or, or change the status, things like that, it's going to require changing that updated at value, which is currently the sort key. But that causes some complications for us because that's part of the primary key, right? It's the it's it's the sort key where you have the, the composite primary key. And, and changing any element of that primary key requires doing a delete operation and then a put, which is inserting a new item because you're not changing changing an item at that point, you're actually deleting one and, and inserting another because that, that primary key is what uniquely identifies that item. So that's kind of a complicated operation where you need to uh, be deleting and putting instead of just doing an update operation in place. Now, the good news is, if that changing attribute is in a secondary index, DynamoDB is going to handle that for you as they replicate that data over into a secondary index. So that's what you should do here, right? If you have an attribute that's going to be changing that you want some sorting on, take it out of your primary key and put it into that secondary index instead. So let's go back to that example here. You know, we, we have our, our 
primary key with the organ organization name and the updated at and and you can see we have this attribute of ticket id right and we probably have some access patterns around ticket id as well so instead what we're going to do we're just going to switch um that ticket id and make that be the sort key and we're going to move updated at into just a regular attribute here now this is what our data looks like uh in this new format here where um, the the primary key is now org name and ticket ID and that updated ad is, is set as an attribute and now we can create a secondary index that's based on organization name and updated at which is going to allow us to say hey get the most recently updated items within a particular organization our sort key is going to look like this going to be structured that way and handle that and and basically it looks exactly as our our, our basic table did before uh, but we don't have that complication of, of handling a delete and a put whenever we want to change that updated at attribute so that's that's really nice for us there. So that's my first tip. You utilize that secondary index. Rely on DynamoDB to handle that uh, when you're when you're sorting on changing attributes. The second best practice I have here is is I want I want you to overload your secondary indexes. And we we talked about overloading before. I didn't I didn't use that terminology, but overloading is when you're including uh, multiple different item types in the same sort of access. Um, area right so within a primary key if you have different item types within a table um, you're overloading that primary key and you just want to overload your secondary indexes in the same way to handle multiple different access patterns on different entity types uh, within the same secondary index so let's go back here to that SAS application before where we overloaded our primary key by putting both organization items and user items in there as well and let's imagine we have some additional access patterns on on both of these types of items so two additional access patterns we're going to do the first one you know um, on the organization item imagine we want to be able to get a list uh, of all organizations you know maybe sorted by organization name or, or things like that so we might put all organizations into the same item collection in our secondary indexes which means you know that our, our organizations are going to have um, all organization items will have the same partition key in that secondary index likewise for our users we have a different access pattern maybe within a particular organization we want to get the most recently updated users so similar to that ticket example we just showed here so here in our base table we have that organization item and our user items um, what we're going to do here is we're going to add these attributes here. And, and if you've looked and I've uh, outlined these attributes in red, you can see that the attribute names are, again, generic, just like that primary key. So our primary key is named PK and SK. And here for our, 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 our global secondary index attributes, we have GSI1, which is global secondary index 1, PK. So the partition key for our, our global secondary index 1, and GSI1 SK, which, which has uh, global secondary index 1 sort key, right? And it has these generic values. And notice that those values are different depending on the type of item where the organization has that organization PK um, to handle putting all the organization items into the same uh, item collection. And then the users have the organization name as their PK and then the, they're updated at as the sort key there. So again, there we are uh, noting those generic items, those attributes. Let's look at that secondary index here. And you can see up top, all of our organizations are put into the same item collection there, which makes it easy to say, hey, give me all the organizations within this SaaS application. And here we get Berkshire Hathaway, we get Facebook. Um, but down below then we can also handle a different access pattern that's more specific to um, users within a particular organization. So we say, can say, hey, give me all the users within this organization ordered by their, uh, the, when they were created or when they were updated, anything like that. And we can do that here very quickly and efficiently. So. Uh, the big thing I want to hammer home is just like you would overload your primary key in your table, overload your secondary indexes because you are limited on how many secondary indexes you get. And this can uh, make it more efficient in your, your use of those secondary indexes. Now, the third tip I want to talk about is using sparse indexes to filter data. And this is one of my favorite tips. I think it's really flexible uh, and fun and, and pretty interesting on what you can use to, to filter out data. So uh, we talked a little bit about sparse indexes before, but I just want to reiterate here that only items that have all elements of a secondary index primary key will be copied over. So when you're creating that secondary index and you're declaring what that primary key is going to be for that secondary index, if you have an item that doesn't have uh, those elements for that primary key, it's not going to be included into your secondary index. And sometimes you can use that strategically uh, to act as a filter on your data. And there are really two different strategies that I want to talk about here. 
The first strategy is when you're filtering within a particular entity type based on a condition, right? So we might have multiple different entity types in our table. We might have users and organizations and say within a particular entity type, within users, we wanna filter based on some condition. So that's what we're gonna do here. Let's go back to that SAS example. And let's say we want an access pattern where we say, hey, I wanna get the admins, just the administrative users for a particular organization and, and return those users to me. So what we've done here is I've outlined in red, again, adding our GSI 1 PK and SK values. Uh, the important thing I wanna note here is we have two users, one from Berkshire and one from Facebook that are administrators. So we have Warren Buffett, he's an administrator. And because of that, he we give him GSI 1 PK values and GSI 1 SK values. Same thing with Cheryl Sandberg, who's an administrator at Facebook. She gets GSI 1 PK values and GSI 1 SK values. Now, look, here's another user. This is Charlie Munger. He belongs to that Berkshire organization. He is a user, but his role is member. He's not an administrator. So we want to filter him out in this access pattern. So what we're going to do is not give him the GSI 1 PK and GSI 1 SK values. And then he's not going to be included in that secondary index. Now, the important thing to note here about this particular strategy with sparse indexes is you can still overload the secondary index and use um, different access patterns for different entity types in different ways. So here we still have that, that organizations-based access pattern where we're uh, putting all organizations into the same um, partition key so we can get all organizations at once. Now, let's go look at our secondary index there. You can see the items got copied over there. The important thing to note here is Berkshire only has one user that was copied over. Warren Buffett was copied over, but Charlie Munger was not copied over because he did not have, he was not an admin and thus did not get the GSI 1 PK and GSI 1 SK values. So in this particular strategy, we're filtering within an entity type. We are filtering it within users specifically based on a particular condition. The condition was, are they an admin or not? And if they are an admin, they get those values. If they're not an admin, they don't get those values. So that's the first strategy. That one works with overloading the index, meaning you can still use that index for different access patterns for um, other types of entities. The second strategy here is when you're projecting a single type of entity into a secondary index. And, and the access pattern here is sometimes people wanna say, hey, I wanna look at all of my um, items of, of entity type X or of type Y. Um, and that can be tough to do, especially if you need to filter through your entire database looking at all these different entity types. So. Let's look at an example here. Imagine you're running an e-commerce application. We've got three different types of entities here. We have customers at the top. We have orders in the middle, so customers come and make orders. And then we also have inventory, and it's just saying how many um, items we have in our particular, or how many of each item we have in our inventory. Now, imagine our marketing department comes to us and says, hey, once a week we wanna send out a marketing email to all of our customers. How do we get those customer email addresses? And if you looked at your table as a whole, you would have to scan the entire table, filter out orders, filter out inventory, and just get to those customers. And it's likely you're going to... Now I make a secondary index that uses that customer index ID um, as, as the primary key in that secondary index. And the important thing here is now customers will be copied into that index, but orders won't be and inventory won't be. So if you go look at our secondary index, this is what we have here. We have just our customers here. There's no orders, there are no items. Uh, it's very quick and efficient. And now we can just scan this. We, our, our marketing department gets all their uh, customers very quickly and they don't have to worry about filtering through um, orders and inventory and that. So. Those are the two access patterns there, and I really love those sparse indexes. But uh, uh, in, in terms of summary, I can wrap this talk up and, and just cover what we covered today. Uh, first of all, we talked about some DynamoDB basics. You know, we went through the terminology of table, item, primary key, and attributes. We talked a little bit more about primary key and, and how important that is.
Uh, then we talked about SQL versus NoSQL and, and learning some of those NoSQL data design uh, patterns you're going to see and how it differs from, from a relational database and, and really understanding why it's different. And, and part, most of that is because of that primary key access and it's also because there are no joins in DynamoDB. And again, that's all protecting uh, DynamoDB's guiding principle of, of, you know, don't allow operations that won't scale. Third, uh, we talked about some secondary index basics because secondary indexes are, are very important for how you model data in DynamoDB. If you want to allow for multiple access patterns on, on particular items, the uh, secondary indexes are very important. And then finally, we covered some best practices for secondary indexes, including that tip about, you know, sorting on changing attributes, including overloading your secondary indexes, and then finally ending with uh, those sparse index strategies there at the end. So any questions, I'm happy to uh, hang around and answer some questions. Um, if you think about some questions after the fact, feel free to reach out on Twitter. You know, I'm at Alex B. Debris. I'm always happy to answer questions. If you want to get the book, that's at dynamodbbook.com. If you want the guide, that's useful too, dynamodbguide.com. And then alexdebris.com. I do a lot of blogging around AWS and, and a lot of DynamoDB. So if you want to learn some DynamoDB principles, uh, go check that out. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, Alex is the son. So I, I, I posed my question, but I can reiterate it. Um, we had, you know, some scenarios where we, you know, the primary key ended up really not being distributed. And we tried to, uh, you know, kind of uh, add a hash to it. So it actually, you know, can move across. Is that the correct pattern? Or do you think that we're, you know, because you, you want to distribute that workload. I mean, especially when we have millions of organization, you don't want to hit one place for all these organizations. Yep, great question. And I'm going to reshare my screen just to um, share some concepts again. Hold on. All right, can you all see my slides? Yep. Okay. Um, so yeah, Hassan, you make a great point about um, changing up your your partition key because if we think about how that that data is distributed across that partition key, it's going to be by those different partitions, and that's why you want to have a lot of unique values there. So this is that secondary index pattern where we're overloading our secondary indexes and having a few um, things here. I do want to talk about one thing. Like if you look at this particular. Um, item collection, you see we're putting all organizations into the same item collection, which means in the secondary index, all organizations have the same partition key. And usually some, that's something I'd be, I'd be pretty nervous about doing. I usually don't recommend this pattern unless you know that the number of organizations is gonna be pretty small and you're not gonna have, um, you're gonna be exceeding the, the partition throughput limits, which um, we didn't discuss here, but basically you can't do more than 3,000 uh, read capacity units or 1000 write capacity units per partition key per second. Um, so if you were going to have a ton of items with that same partition key, that's where you can get into trouble there. So um, that's generally something you want to avoid unless you, you know you're sort of not going to be exceeding those limits. But in most cases, if you look down below uh, in this one, you know, that partition key, that's where we're adding in something unique about that particular item. So here we're adding in the, the organization name. So we have org hash and then the organization name. And that means you know, each organization is going to have its own um, partition key, its own item collection, which is going to be on different nodes now, and then they're going to be split across. And, and another thing to note here, I, I sort of mentioned this when I was talking about partitioning, but when that item comes in, they're going to look at the partition key, and they're going to hash it before they find out which actual partition it goes to, and that's going to help split up these nodes. So even though, you know, because of these prefixes, you'd have um, partitions that look like they'd be next to each other, like this org Berkshire and org Facebook, since they both start with org, you might think they'd be on the same partition next to each other, but because they hash that key before they place it, then they'll distribute it out even if those partition keys are sequential. So there's no ordering across those partition keys other than after the hash function, which you don't know about and, and so can't handle. Does that, does that make sense? Does that answer uh, yeah, I mean, it does make sense. Uh, I mean, we had, we had to kind of go a little bit more further uh, because that even that suffix with hash uh, were ended up coming to a partition always, you know, and we had to kind of uh, 
become a little bit more creative in terms of our data just so we can spread it spread it nicely right so yeah gotcha uh, so I mean, you had okay. like a particular sort of set of items that were was accessed much more frequently than others that was yeah it's exactly of... exactly i mean there these were more um, you know uh, very operation data coming in and and we had to kind of uh, for to pick up uh, some some type of uh, data coming in we had to like really drill down to a to a specific set of combination of data and, but okay i yeah. i just kind of curious if if we're doing something off the realm here, or you may say, no, guys, I think this is a better way of doing it. So. Yep. And I mean, the one thing I would say about that, I, I think understanding that having some high cardinality in your partition key and really spreading it across partitions is, is useful to know. There used to be more, um, I guess, like sort of limits around DynamoDB about how that worked. And they've really done a good job over the last couple of years of, of getting rid of those limits. So really the only thing you need to work about, worry about in terms of spreading out those partition keys are those partition throughput limits where, you know, no matter how much capacity you've provisioned, you can't exceed more than 3000 read capacity units or 1000 write capacity units on a, on a single partition. So if you're not at the scale where you're even gonna be messing with that, then you can get a little more flexible on, on some of this stuff. But if you are at the scale where, hey, you know, we're doing a lot of reads and writes, then you need to make sure you really have the high cardinality um, partition keys there. Yeah, cool. Okay. yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Yep, cool. Okay, I'm gonna go back. Um, so I know there were some other questions. Um, so if I had, Alex, how do you describe DynamoDB first normal form, second, third normal form, all items in one table? And this is a great point, and I and I talk about this in the book, so go check that out there. But basically, um, you know, if you've done a lot of relational database modeling, you learn about normalization and all these different forms. Um, with DynamoDB, you, you sort of have to get away from that a little bit. You're not going to have your data as well normalized. It's going to be denormalized in some places, which means you might be repeating your data in a couple different spots. You might also have attributes that include um, not just like scalar values, like a string, but more complex values like a list or a map. It includes multiple things. You might include uh, related items directly, or yeah, related items directly on an item itself as an attribute. So you will get away from some of those uh, normalization concepts for a second normal first, second, third normal form. And that's just the way DynamoDB works. And, and I, and I think normalization, it gives you two things. Number one, it saves on storage costs because you're not uh, duplicating data all over the place. Now storage cost isn't as big a concern right now because storage is a lot cheaper than CPU. So I think, I think you can give up that one pretty easily. The other thing that normalization does give you is it, it gives you better data integrity, right? Where if you do update a piece of data, you only need to update it in one spot rather than in all the eight or 15 or a hundred different spots that it's been duplicated. So you do need to think about that and understand your update patterns and say, okay, if I am duplicating this data, is that data immutable? Um, if it's not immutable, how many times am I uh, updating it and, or, or replicating it? And how am I going to discover when I need to update that? And you do need to think about that. Um, so that, that's something you do lose. But then when you, um, so I, I guess that's a benefit that you lose of normalization, but then um, a benefit you get of denormalization is you can structure your data in a way that it, uh, allows for more efficient access um, rather than more efficient storage. Does that answer your question? Are there any follow-ups on that one too? Cool, thanks. Yeah, um, Fahad saying NoSQL is new to you and, and it's totally a different mindset and, and it feels very weird, especially the normalization stuff. That's very hard for me. I see a lot of people try to model uh, NoSQL like they model SQL and they get into trouble a little bit. So you, I, I think that normalization part is, is one of the hardest things to get at. So, um, another question from Danny, should secondary indexes be unique, of course, in addition to the primary key? So I think the question you're asking here is, um, I guess with the primary key in the, in the main table, you need to uniquely identify each item by that primary key. And then you're asking, I think in the secondary index, is that true as well? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, one of the great things about secondary indexes is you don't have that same uniqueness requirement on that secondary index. So you can have um, multiple items with the same values. So let me find. Um, so one example here would be um, if we go back to that sparse index example, that first one I showed where we want to replicate all the administrators in there. You know, if I had multiple administrators for a, a single company, whether it's Berkshire or Facebook, something like that, 
for all of those items that I put in there in that secondary index, they would have that same partition key of org hash and the organization name. And then their short key would be admin. And that's, that's okay in a secondary index to have multiple items with the same attributes. Um, you won't be doing writes on your secondary index. All your writes have to come on that uh, main table. And that's why they, they can't allow you to uh, have multiple items in that secondary index with the, with the same, um, same values. I wouldn't always recommend that. Like I, I did that in this case as an example, um, but really I'd probably have um, something different as the sort key. Cause usually you want to be able to sort of filter within that sort key as you want. So I'd maybe have the username or maybe the date created or something. It sort of depends on your access patterns there. But if you are gonna get all of them, then maybe you could just go with, with this um, admin approach on that sort key. But usually that sort key is gonna be something mean, meaningful that you can sort on. And, and like one great use of, of this secondary index and especially taking advantage of that sorting and, and duplication is if you were doing a leaderboard, right? So if you had um, a, some kind of gaming application within each game in your application, you wanted to have a leaderboard, you could handle that in your secondary index. And that's good for a couple different reasons. Number one, that's, that's probably a changing attribute that we were talking before. The score is gonna be changing. So if you can have that in your secondary index, it's easy to update the score, but then efficiently query that score and find the top five or top 10 uh, people in that game pretty easily without doing deletes and puts. It also helps here where you can have multiple people having the same score um, and, and not um, clashing with each other. So that's a, another nice benefit of, of using the secondary index. So leaderboard, very popular for a secondary index use case. Any other questions? And you can feel free to type them. You can hop on in a question or uh, with your mic, however it works. <clears throat> okay, Roshan, what's the best practice to store array of object attributes? Um, split them in attributes or a list map would be fine. So um, this is this is a good question from Roshan. Like, how do I how do I store those attributes? You know, if Dynamo allows me to do these complex attributes like lists and maps, should I do that or should I use um, flatter attributes and just sort of flatten them out. I think that's mostly a question of personal preference. Um, one thing Rick Houlihan has said, who Rick Houlihan, he works for AWS and does a lot of DynamoDB advanced data modeling. and I've, I've learned a ton from him. He has recommended um, putting them all into a single attribute. It's just a little quicker behind the scenes how DynamoDB accesses it that way if it's in a single attribute. Um, I think that benefit is gonna be pretty negligible unless you maybe have really big items. Um, in general, I think I usually split them out as, as separate attributes just because I find them easier to work with and especially writing update expressions. If I'm doing something like that, it's easier to update an attribute than like a nested map somewhere, I think. Um, but it depends a little bit. It depends on how much that data conceptually goes together. I would say it's more likely for me to like make a, a list attribute than it is for a, a map attribute. Um, generally because like a list attribute, it, it generally assumes some ordering and, and it's hard to like sort of split those out and have like element one, element two, element three as attributes, whereas you, you want to keep them as a list altogether. But then a map, you know, I can usually split those out into separate attributes I can, I can access with names directly. Uh, let me know if you'd like any uh, additional clarification on that as well. Um, I'm going to move to the next question from Danny. How many secondary indexes can we have I should know this better. I'm pretty sure it's 20 global secondary indexes. And I actually think you can increase that as well if you want to. Although I would say I've, I've never even come close to 20, even on a table with, that has a lot of different examples. And like one of the examples in the book, it has, I think 12 or 15 entities in it. They're one of the GitHub examples and it only uses like five global secondary indexes because of the way you do overloading there. So you can handle a lot of different access patterns there. Um, but I, yeah, I think you can do 20 global and I'm pretty sure it's five local, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, the big caveat there with local, it needs to be declared uh, when your table is created. And then also it needs to have the same partition key as your base table. So it's pretty unlikely you use five local secondary indexes, but you can. Uh, but global is going to be the big one. And that's 20. And I'm pretty sure it's not a hard limit. I think you could ask for more if you wanted to, though. I think you usually wouldn't. Any other questions? Derek, Derek, do you have any question? Dan's got another one. Can you use the secondary index to summarize data by different indexes? Um, can you tell me what, can you explain a little further on what you mean by that one? Um, 
Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a case where I'm, uh, some, let's say I, I have a table where I have all my uh, sales data. And the data uh, can have multiple attributes like the, uh, the order type, maybe the customer, and uh, different other attributes. What, I, what I'm doing currently is actually I'm creating a different a table for different kind of reports that, that I want to generate. For instance, if I want the sales by uh, product type, uh, I'm actually grouping items and uh, grouping them uh, uh, before inserting them into the, uh, the NoSQL database. So the thing is, I'm trying, I'm seeing if uh, the secondary index can, can, can be used for this purpose so that I just want to group all my sales by, let's say, first of all, by customer, and then by, uh, so it's just summary. It's not only just listing of values. And, uh, and as we talked, uh, we have something called an item collection. So maybe if we group them into secondary ind indexes, can the item collection be used to get the, straight away different formats of my data summarized uh, by certain uh, number field, for instance? Yeah, so you can't do summaries across items with DynamoDB it's, itself. So you couldn't do like a sum order amount um, where this is the, the partition key and maybe this is the range of sort keys. You'd actually have to fetch all those items yourself and then do those sums itself. And this goes back to that principle that DynamoDB has of they don't want you to allow operations that won't scale. Um, and if you think about how that sum could happen, it's sort of unbounded in how many items you could be looking at. Because what if someone sort of issued that across your entire table or even within a single item collection that had, you know, 4 million items in it. And now it needs to, to sum through all those. And we, what we want to have with DynamoDB is that, that flat performance chart where if it works at one gig, it's going to work at one terabyte. And that's where you don't know what those aggregations because it's got to, to sum it across those. So a couple of things you can do if, if it's going to be a small amount of items in uh, one particular facet, you know, within an order type and maybe a customer ID, you could just um, set up your secondary indexes to group by a customer ID and then maybe have your that order type in the sort key and you could just go fetch those and sum them yourself in your application. Maybe you're, you're fetching, you know, uh, a few hundred kilobytes of data, but it's, it's still pretty efficient. Um, if that's not going to be true and it's going to be larger than that, then you might need to perform some of those aggregations yourself and sort of um, keep them up to date. So the bad part about this is you need to know your, your access patterns ahead of time. But say a new order comes in, you know, it's for customer uh, ABC, it's this type of order and it's, you know, $50. You would go at, increment some counter somewhere that said, okay, for this customer, for this order type, they just spent $50 and have that counter. Now you have like an aggregate in one single item. And now if you need to display that aggregate, you can just pull that back and, and, and show it to the user. So you can do that. Again, it, it requires you to know that in advance, which is a bummer. If you're talking for more internal ad hoc query use cases where you want to say, okay, this customer, this order type, but also within this specific date range and only if this element is true or something like that. Now you're getting into ad hoc query patterns. You probably need a data warehouse, right? To export your data into uh, Amazon Redshift or Snowflake or uh, maybe S3 and Athena or something like that to handle it if you really want those ad hoc query patterns. But yeah, that's, that's a good question. Cool. Any other questions? Great question so far. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here.